Okay, now we have finally arrived at the end of this lecture. Let's uh, have a look back at what we have learned today. Uh, not only today, but what we have learned uh, during the entire semester. Um, so this is just a list of the different courses and um, we are now in, in course 11 today. Um, first of all, we saw the introduction uh, to, 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 to tell you how great this topic is, um, how, how, which variety of problems can be solved as convex optimization problems. And we also saw a couple of, of initial um, definitions and, and gradient descent, which is like the, the starting point um, of, of, of optimization in, that are continuous and convex. In the second lecture, we learned about Newton's method. We also learned a lot about linear algebra. We learned how to solve the Fibonacci sequence uh, with linear algebra and uh, about the Newton's method and uh, how much of a speed up we can bet, get by considering second order information also during optimization. Then we added constraints, first inequality constraints and uh, logarithmic barriers as the trick to convert them back to something that can be solved, for example, with, with the Newton method. Um, and in the fourth lecture, we added equality constraints and uh, this allowed us to solve problems, for example, the Kantorowicz transport problem. Um, this already is enough, essentially, for uh, convex optimization. Everything else is, quote-unquote, just speed up. So in lecture five, uh, we looked at a couple of applications from designing a mechanical truss structure like a bridge uh, to finance, model predictive control. So a lot of practical optimization problems that are at the heart of the different disciplines have been looked at and, and solved in, in lecture five. Then we switched gears a little bit. We looked at automatic differentiation and how we can essentially uh, apply optimization methods to any numerical algorithm by having an automatic differentiation that just falls out um, from, 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 from the code that doesn't uh, require us to do a symbolic differentiation. And um, um, we had the simulation where we were rescuing Mark Watney uh, from Mars uh, by optimizing the trajectory of the rocket. And uh, we also saw how essentially automatic differentiation just gives us the backpropagation algorithm that are the heart of, of neural networks. Okay. Lecture seven, optimization in vector spaces. Uh, this was again some more mathematical background that we needed for, for, for the next lecture on duality, but it has also some nice applications on its own uh, because in vector spaces um, and especially in Hilbert spaces uh, we can now do a projection uh, for which we know that is a, a minimum, minimum distance projection for a certain norm and uh, there are already applications for that for example approximating the sine function with a polynomial or the eigenphases problem to find uh, gangsters based on photographs from them. Okay. Now, the next lecture, we got back to uh, the traditional uh, syllabus for, for convex optimization, duality and the primal dual algorithms. There we uh, learned about the Lagrange duality and uh, about primal dual algorithms that again bring us a nice speed up. Uh, we also uh, saw Slater conditions and the KKD conditions um, so that we can uh, have a, a lower bound on our optimization problem. Uh, by going uh, via the, the Lagrangian dual. Okay. The next lecture, support vector machines and the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. This was now the application of convex optimization theory to one of the most successful algorithms in uh, machine learning, the support vector machine, and uh, how essentially the, the theory for duality is not only for, for some speed up, but uh, it, it also unlocks um, um, uh, the SVM, which wouldn't be possible without duality theory, because then we couldn't apply the kernel function uh, to efficiently do nonlinear classification. Okay. Lecture 10 on conic programming. Uh, this showed us how uh, many 
different classes of optimization problem can be transformed into conic optimization problems for which we have, uh, for example, nice dual definitions and we can also have a fast uh, a projection on the cone, uh, at least for some of the ni nice cones that we have looked at. So the non-negative orphaned, the second order cone and the semi-definite cone are, are like the poster uh, examples for, for, for conic programming and, and the speedups that we can get there. And lastly, today we saw a gradient free and non convex optimization, so a small outlook. What can you do if convex optimization is not enough? Because just the application uh, that you're looking at is not convex per se. Uh, what are the other options that you have? Um, and also, what, what can you do, for example, if, if you don't have uh, gradient information and you also cannot do automatic differentiation? So, this is called zeroth order optimization. And first order would with the gradient and second order with the Hessian and so on. So what can you do in the zeroth order case? And we saw a couple of algorithms there also for uh, combinatorial optimization and lastly uh, stochastic optimization settings. Okay, so this was what we have saw in, what we saw in, the, in this semester, uh, but this is not all. Yeah? So Optimization in general is, is, is a big subject and convex optimization is not the only thing there is. Now let's have a small uh, not outlook, but let's, let's broaden the scope even more. Other techniques that uh, can be used for decision making and uh, here two examples are uh, that we look at are symbolic planning and search. And the other is inference, so logical and also probabilistic inference. So uh, symbolic planning and search, I'm now here on the left hand side. Symbolic planning and search is something that goes back to the very beginning of the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, there was a famous paper by, by Fikes, um, the Stanford uh, planning system. And uh, what they do is they are in a setting with a small robot uh, that can take actions and the actions have preconditions and effects. And the question is, starting from some goal, from some initial situation, how can the actions and their preconditions and effects be changed together in a way to find the goal state? Yeah. So imagine the situation, um, the, um, the, the banana is on the top shelf, and the monkey wants to get the banana, then he has to move the box in front of the shelf and then he can climb on the box and get the banana. And you can imagine that also for a robot setting or um, any other scenario where, where there are discrete actions and you want to uh, uh, find a way to achieve a certain goal starting from the initial situation. And this is what these symbolic AI planners do. And uh, from Helmut et al, this is the fast downward planning system. This is an open source algorithm, which is one of the uh, best performing AI planning algorithms that we have today. And uh, um, uh, you can also just out of the box use these um, if you can formulate your uh, problem as a symbolic AI planning problem. There is a language called uh, PDDL. Uh, so planning domain definition language and you can just write in this language you can write down the actions and the preconditions and effects and uh, the, the book by Gallup so here automated planning it will tell you all about uh, PDDL and how you can then imply, apply an, an off-the-shelf solver to, to solve your planning, planning problems. So this is also decision making has nothing to do with optimization as we saw it in this course. Okay, uh, a closely related uh, field is uh, satisfiability. So for satisfiability, you have constraints and these are often combinatorial constraints. And um, you are looking for a solution for any solution that fulfills these constraints, or you might even have an objective function uh, as we had here, but uh, not necessarily. Um, and, and this is satisfiability and it comes from a different scientific lineage. Uh, and there is uh, this mini-sync language and IDE where you can uh, define your uh, satisfiability problem 
and uh, and then there are a lot of different solvers in the back end that uh, you can throw at at your satisfiability problem and uh, like the the SAT satisfiability problem is also one of the famous uh, problems with high high complexity to to solve and there is now there are also now some extensions like SMT SMT stands for satisfiability modulo theories where you can also have a lot of where you can plug in knowledge from 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 uh, application domains uh, into into uh, into this satisfiability service as well and there is a lot of very active research around this and also uh, you can you can use this also as part of a system that has to do decision making at at runtime okay a completely different uh, field but also useful for decision making is now here on the right hand side is inference and we are splitting this in two parts into logical and in probabilistic inference so logical inference um, this is well for example inference in first order logic and uh, the big breakthrough to that came with a unification algorithm so there was a first solution uh, by, by Bertrand, Jacques Bertrand um, but the unification algorithm used today it is from Robinson in the 60s and this was this kick-started uh, for example the Prolog language and uh, this is a often overlooked programming language but very powerful in its own right and um, in the 80s many well uh, expert systems and, and classical AI systems were, were built with uh, with Prolog where you can do reasoning in first order logic. There are also uh, inference and logical inference systems that go beyond that. For example, the entire semantic web. So if you think about RDF and other um, um, uh, ontologies and semantic description environments, these are often based on description logics and, and these are a variation of, of second order logic. Okay. Um, and uh, the other inference that I want to talk uh, to you about today is probabilistic inference. So what happens if you have a big probability distribution uh, as a prior and then you have additional information and your system gets new information at runtime? Um, famous example for that is the Kalman filter. Um, so the Kalman filter, you can look that up, which famously was developed to, to send rockets to the moon so that the astronauts could integrate uh, position measurements uh, with what they knew about the trajectory of and the previous position of the, of the rocket and so on. Um, but uh, what we today understand under probabilistic inference, uh, it often refers to uh, probabilistic graphical models. There is this uh, book by, by Koller and Friedman, which is a rather thick book, but, but also complete. You can also look at the online course uh, provided by Koller. And um, um, this is also a success story because uh, suddenly very complicated settings with a lot of uh, interconnected uh, random variables that, that produce a joint distribution uh, become tractable and there is um, the famous uh, message passing algorithm by Julia Pearl. So message passing where you have messages being sent between uh, so-called factors in this uh, probability graphs and now you can uh, with this message passing approach you can efficiently uh, do inference in probabilistic settings. Um, there's also a connection between the two sides because this message passing idea uh, for probabilistic inference it has also applications for satisfiability solving but this goes way beyond the scope of this lecture. The entire uh, takeaway from this slide is that optimization is not everything and there are a lot of existent result and hundreds of many years of work from research groups around the world uh, to develop uh, very generic solution techniques and when you find out that your problem fits into one of these categories then oftentimes they are very efficient off-the-shelf servers that you can apply to use but you need to have some background information and maybe understand some mathematics in order to bring your problem into a form 
that is readily acceptable by these off-the-shelf solvers. That's it. We are finally at the end of the course, Optimization Method for Machine Learning and Engineering. Let me take uh, a few minutes to thank the entire team that was involved in development of this course. Uh, so, Constanze Hasterock uh, from Fraunhofer EOSB as well, uh, Josefine Rehak, who is at the EAS chair, um, Alexander Striffler, who was uh, an, an external contributor, and uh, also Jan Philipp Sauer, who uh, was responsible for the production of the videos that you have enjoyed on Ilias and also on, on YouTube. Uh, last but not least, let me also thank Professor Bayer, uh, who, who provided guidance and, uh, and uh, who also invited me at the chair to, to hold this uh, lecture series uh, in this uh, winter semester. Make good use of the techniques from this lecture. Uh, you are now halfway from being a computer scientist to uh, being a bona fide engineer, or at least you can now have a good interaction also with engineers um, uh, by, by using some of the same language. Uh, you are also halfway, let me say, into uh, uh, really serious research topics. Uh, by going deeper from here, you would have to go into, let's say, PhD level material. Um, um, but uh, this is not all theory from the Ivory Tower. I hope that I could convince you that um, we, could, uh, we can solve a lot of practical problems by considering uh, optimization. And um, to say it with a quote from Wilhelm Leibniz, calculemus, let us compute. <laughs>